So thank you for joining us this morning or this afternoon or evening. We are going to hear from Freddie Bowen, who is with the Confraternity of St. James in the UK. And he is going to start sharing with us about Caminos in the UK. Lovely, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Let me just uh, share my screen with you. Um, okay, this all works. Um, we'll improvise. Okay. So yes, hello, hi, uh, my name is Freddie. Uh, I'm delighted to be here talking to you today on behalf of Camino Pilgrim at the Confraternity of St. James UK. I thought I would share with you a little about a little bit about who we are uh, as an organization and what we do before talking about the growing network of Caminos in the United Kingdom. So to start off, in case any of you are unfamiliar, we are the Confraternity of St. James UK, trading under the name Camino Pilgrim, to make us sound a little less frightening. And we are a registered charity that advises and supports anyone interested in the Camino de Santiago, whatever their background, motivation, beliefs, or ability. We are completely inclusive and our services are open to everyone. At our core, we're just like you. We are a community of friendly, welcoming people. Uh, we're largely volunteer run and we have a membership base of around 1200 people worldwide, but predominantly in the UK. All from different walks of life, uh, but all united by a common passion for all things Camino. Uh, we're here for each other and all pilgrims to offer expertise, reassurance and friendship. Uh, as well as, we also strive to promote the pilgrimages, art, architecture, and music through research and publications and lectures. And as we'll hear more about a little bit later, we also work to revive and promote Caminos in the UK. These will be pilgrim routes that were used or probably used in the Middle Ages by pilgrims on their way to Santiago. Uh, we support pilgrims at all stages of their journey. We support them before they go. We are a one-stop shop for all advice and guidance needed to make the journey uh, practical or otherwise. Pilgrims can talk to us person to person with our experienced members and have all of their questions answered. We run practical pilgrim days, uh, office open days, webinars and masterclasses to cover off as many practical topics as we can to help pilgrims prepare. And we do also distribute the Pilgrim Passport or Credencial. We support pilgrims while they're out there. We run two pilgrim hostels or albergues in Spain. The first, named Refugio Galfelmo, opened in 1991 in the small village of Rabanal del Camino on the most popular Camino route, the Frances. And the other, Albergue San Martín, opened in 2010 in the rural village of Miraz on the Camino del Norte. Uh, both are staffed by our own trained volunteers and offer beds and welcome to pilgrims walking to Santiago for just a donation. You can see that's where they are on the map. And we support pilgrims after they've come back. We encourage them to let us know how it went and provide opportunities like returned pilgrims days and more relaxed social events, uh, both in person and on Zoom for them to talk about their experiences with other people who have done it and might understand the sorts of things that they're feeling. Uh, we also offer a number of ways of learning more about the Camino through lectures, publications, our library, and our members magazine, The Bulletin. We have our central London office. We also have over 20 regional centers today. Uh, each of which organise their own get-togethers, talks and activities in small groups. These have particularly thrived in the last couple of years, thanks in part to the efforts of individual volunteers coordinating them, but also due to having to stay local during the uh, recent lockdowns. Whilst people were unable to travel to Spain, Portugal, France or anywhere, they instead got to know their local areas a bit more, uh, discovering their area's connections to walking, pilgrimage and St James. 
The culture of pilgrimage in the United Kingdom has, of course, been historically smashed by Henry VIII in the 16th century upon his order of the dissolution of monasteries, forbidding the veneration of saints and cancelling the notion of pilgrimage in this country. But there has been a real movement in the last few years among the public towards walking for health generally. And for those spiritually inclined, there's obviously the other dimension to it as well. We have organizations now like the British Pilgrimage Trust who are championing this movement with a comprehensive directory of routes and maps which have made pilgrim routes much more accessible all over the country. Uh, and there now is a collection of them with historic links to the Camino in Spain, which is where we come in. So the Pilgrim Office in Santiago uh, and the cathedral there mandated not too long ago that in order to qualify for a Compostela certificate of having completed the Camino, you had to walk a minimum of the last 100 kilometers into Santiago. And it, the most popular starting point on any Camino since then has been Sarria, the town almost exactly 100 kilometers from Santiago on the Camino Frantes. But a popular choice among British pilgrimage for its name, its history and its length was the Camino Inglés, so called English Way. According to historical accounts documented by the likes of Constance Stores in the mid to late 20th century for her trailblazing MA thesis in medieval pilgrimage from the British Isles to St. James of Compostela, the more common port into which pilgrims sailed from the UK, Ireland, Brittany and Scandinavia was the city of A Coruña. And with such a rich history and culture, as well as direct flights from London, it made the most sense for modern pilgrims to start their Camino from there. However, A Coruña is only 75 kilometers from Santiago, give or take. So by the modern standard of minimum distance, a pilgrim could not qualify for a Compostela certificate if they'd walked from there. And so the nearby town of Ferrol was chosen as the official start point of the Camino Inglés, being a whole 110 kilometers from Santiago, despite the fact it was smaller, less culturally rich, and had historically fewer ties to Jacobean pilgrimage from Northern Europe. Well, the historians, historians at the CSJ uh, would not stand for this. They explained to the Dean of Santiago Cathedral that this made not much sense historically, uh, and that pilgrims walked from A Coruña, following the footsteps of the medieval ancestor, official recognition from Santiago Cathedral. And so a compromise was reached. Santiago said, okay, pilgrims walking the 75 kilometers from A Coruña can qualify for a Compostela certificate provided that they walk at least 25 kilometers in their home country first, making it the total to 100 and they must have collected the stamps in their pilgrim credential to prove it. Since then, further clarification has been made that the pilgrim must have walked on a route with some arguable connection to St. James. And so we at the CSJ have set about our mission of identifying routes within the UK with links to St. James or pilgrimage to Santiago and recommending their official recognition as part of the Camino Inglés network. And our friends at Community Society Ireland are doing exactly the same thing. We have a few on the list already, as you can see, with more on the way. Uh, and uh, we are working closely with the Acoruña Province Council and the Association of Councils on the Camino Inglés to erect way markers, provide pilgrim stamps and publicity to those UK Caminos. Uh, so we'll go through each of them one by one. Don't worry too much if you can't and talk around it. So the first one is called the Pilgrim's Way. Uh, this is from Winchester to Canterbury. It's 153 miles, about 15 days walk. Perhaps the most well-known of British pilgrimage, originally thought to follow a prehistoric track dictated by the existent geography of ridgeways and natural terraces, which provided a link from the narrowest part of the English Channel to places like Stonehenge and Avebury. But after Thomas Beckett's canonization in 1173, Three, his shrine at Canterbury became the most important in the country up until the dissolution of the monasteries in 1538. In Winchester, former capital city of the Kingdom of Wessex and home to the shrine of St. Swithin, the city's venerated miracle performing bishop was an important regional focus and aggregation point for travelers arriving through the seaports on the south coast. Um, the route was famously rediscovered 
discovered by Hilaire Belloc at the turn of the last century, who wrote the famous book, The Old Road. The alternative start point of this route, um, as opposed to Winchester, is actually Southwark in London by way of Watling Street, as followed by the Storytellers in the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Uh, this route is about 90 miles, so 11 days, uh, and joins at a place called Otford with the Winchester to Canterbury Pilgrim's Way. Uh, and this alternative is technically called the Beckett Way because it is believed that this is the journey that Beckett himself made to and from London. So being such an important and well-known thoroughfare for pilgrimage in the south of England between the 1170s and 1530s, it's more than probable that pilgrims would have made their way to Canterbury before continuing onto the coast at Dover or Folkestone and crossing the channel on their way to other great centers of Christian pilgrimage in Europe like Rome, the Holy Land, and of course, Santiago. Next up, we have the St. Michael's Way. This is a one day coast to coast micro pilgrimage in Cornwall. Established in just 1994, uh, the route follows a path likely taken by early Christian pilgrims and missionaries from Ireland and Wales on their way to continental European sites of pilgrimage such as Brittany and Santiago, which avoided the perilous straits around Land's End at the far tip of England. Indeed, ancient shipping rosters were discovered showing the journey of pilgrims landing in Lelant by sea on the north coast, traveling overland to Marizion and Michael's Mount on the south coast before setting sail for Galicia. This was one of the first routes to count towards the 100 kilometer minimum requirement for the Compostela certificate in 2016, once permission granted from the Dean of Santiago. Uh, this route is looked after by a group of volunteers called the Friends of St. Michael's Way, formerly known as the Brederith Santiago, uh, or the Confraternity of St. James in Cornish. Who have, and they've produced their own version of the credential for pilgrims who walk this route before journeying to Acarunia. And there are also stamps held at significant stages along the way. For example, at the start in Lelant, uh, in various refreshment places along the way, in churches, and of course at St. Michael's Mount itself. Currently on the list as well, we have another Cornish route, uh, sort of few names, Who Saints Way, The Saints Way, The Cornish Saints Way, and it goes between Padstow and Foy. Uh, it's 27 miles long, again, probable route of early Christian pilgrims making their way from Ireland and Wales to Brittany and Santiago, avoiding the land's end. It forms part of a longer Cornish Celtic way. Um, and in 1984, some walkers found a series of forgotten granite styles, and this discovery led to a route being created that features ancient footbridges, old tracks, and fascinating medieval churches. Starts at the picturesque harbour in Padstow, uh, and heads along Little Petheric Creek and onto Lanivet before heading south following the edge of the Foy River, skirting the ancient town of Lost Withiel. Next up, we are journeying to the other end of England, far northeast in County Durham, the Finkel Camino Ingles from Chester Street to Bishop Auckland. Again, this is one of the first of the UK routes to be given official recognition as part of the Camino Inglés network in the UK, and obviously they have adopted it in their name to reflect this. From the spectacular ruins of Finkel Priory, where the 12th century hermit St. Godric lived for 50 years, and from where he made one of the earliest recorded pilgrimages from England to Santiago. Uh, the route tracks to Durham Cathedral, where the shrines of the Venerable Bede and St. Cuthbert are housed, before reaching Bishop Auckland. There is a castle there called Auckland Castle, former palace of the Prince Bishops of Durham. It now actually houses 13 life-size paintings of Jacob and his 12 sons by the Spanish painter Francisco de Torbaran. And the route eventually finishes at the Saxon Church of Eskom, the oldest complete Saxon church in the country. Uh, again, run by volunteers, the Friends of the Finkel Camino, comprising many CSJ members, they have signposted the route, you can see in the first picture there, maybe just about a little dark blue sign with the characteristic scallop shell outline provided by the Acorunia Province Council. Uh, and they've been promoting this route very successfully. They even recently hosted Prince Charles and Queen Leticia of Spain. Uh, there is a pilgrim passport as well as stamps available along the way. They have plans to extend this route actually to York, uh, Ripon, and eventually 
joining up with Oxford and Reading in the south of England to create one much longer Camino down the full length of the country. It's maybe a bit of a way off, but uh, they're absolutely working towards that enthusiastically. Next up, a route in Scotland. So the St Andrews Way is actually part of a network of eight routes that share the same name in Scotland. Uh, they actually even say on their website that they expect to emulate the Camino de Santiago in time. The different routes start points include Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Motherwell, Iona, Hexham and Carlisle, and they all culminate in the arrival at the giant ruins of the old cathedral of St Andrews, overlooking the famous sandy beaches and the North Sea. Uh, this route is looked after by the volunteers of the Diocese of Edinburgh and St Andrews, who've created their own St Andrews Way card to assert pilgrim status and collect stamps, some of which the CSJ have produced. On the current list of UK Caminos are two routes to the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, otherwise known as the Nazareth of England. And the reason that it's known as that is that in 1061, Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, appeared there in a vision to a pious Norfolk lady, Richelle de Faverche. And she asked her to build a replica of the House of Nazareth where the Annunciation had taken place. Richelle did this, and the Holy House was cared for by the Augustinian canons of a large abbey church. And Walsingham became the largest Marian shrine in the medieval world. It rivaled Jerusalem and Santiago as a place of pilgrimage. Collectively, it got eight times more in pilgrim offerings than Thomas Becket's shrine in Canterbury. Kings like Henry III and queens, including Catherine of Aragon, came here on pilgrimage. Even Henry VIII himself made pilgrimage here in his early years walking the Holy Mile in, back into Walsingham Abbey barefoot and making offerings for a daily mass to be said there for his intentions. Before, of course, he ransacked the place, burned the statue, murdered two canons and dissolved the abbey along with so many others. Um, and uh, from the 1930s with the Catholic shrine re-established, they also founded an Anglican shrine um, and Walsingham has become once again, the country's most important purely pilgrim destination. Uh, you can see on the maps that it's actually very close to the Norfolk coast um, and we know from shipping lists that pilgrims did make their way to Galicia by boat from settlements like King's Lynn, which you can see on the north coast of that third map there, uh, and modern day Great Yarmouth. It's highly probable, again, that East Anglian pilgrims would have made their way to a port via this highly important shrine, paying their respects both to the Mother of Christ as well as eventually his martyred apostle. The two routes, one from the city of Norwich, around 30 miles, looked after by the canon of the cathedral there, and the other one from London, around 130 miles, documented by CSJ trustee and author Andy Bull, and they both have Camino status now, and are in the process of obtaining Camino Inglés way markers, and on the route from London, uh, they have a fleet of around 16 pilgrim stamps peppered in the many Saxon churches along the route. Uh, there are also plans to include routes from other key starting points for medieval Walsingham pilgrims, uh, cities of Ely, King's Lynn and Cambridge, so as to create a mini pilgrimage network of Walsingham Caminos. Next, we're going to the far south east of England, uh, the Augustan Camino, formerly known as the Way of St Augustine charting the beginnings of Roman Christianity in England and running between Rochester Cathedral to the west and the Shrine of St Augustine in Ramsgate on the coast to the east, which is about a week's walk in total. A bit like the Camino Frances, there are architectural and artistic wonders to be found along this route, including 12th and 13th century wall paintings at Rochester, uh, including what is thought to be the earliest depiction of St Francis in England at a place called Doddington. Uh, the recently restored south window at Canterbury Cathedral is a magnificent example of medieval stained glass uh, and there's work by some of the most foremost um, Victorian artists uh, which can be found all along the route including an unusual Art Nouveau window at a place called Wickham Brew. Architectural delights include the first example of the Gothic style in England at Canterbury the Norman nave at Rochester Cathedral, and more recent work by the Gilbert Scots, William Butterfield, and the Pugins. Uh, there's a lot of historical significance to this route. Kent was the first English 
kingdom in the British Isles and the first to convert to Christianity. Uh, Canterbury is the centre, of course, of the Anglican Communion, leading pilgrimage destination as well as the site of church, which is the oldest in continuous use in the English-speaking world. Abbey, which is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Canterbury. At Rochester Cathedral, there is a copy of King Ethelbert's Laws, which is the oldest in the English language, predating even the Magna Carta. Uh, Aylesford Priory was the mother house of the Carmelite Order on their return from the Crusades, and it still welcomes pilgrims. The St. Augustine's in Ramsgate, um, it's just received a £1 million grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, there's a, a, min, a place called Minster, there's an abbey there, which is old enough to have been attacked by the Vikings, and was recently re-established as a Benedictine convent and shrine to a local saint and Saxon princess called St. Mildred. Uh, so a profound connection to early Christian pilgrimage, um, as well as, as you can see, connections to the coast, again, from where pilgrims could have sailed to Acarunia and walked or ridden to Santiago. Uh, so this was an easy one to get <laughs> communion status for. The last one on the list at the moment uh, is a 68 and a half mile route devised by members of the CSJ, actually. It's called the St. James's Way from Reading to Southampton. The Abbey at Reading, which celebrated its 900th anniversary last year, was at one point the resting place of the hand of St. James, supposedly. Whilst its authenticity as the severed hand of the martyred apostle is disputed, it is believed to be the relic brought back to England by the Empress Matilda in the 12th century, which was lost in the dissolution, but rediscovered in 1786 by workers building Reading Jail. In the Middle Ages, Reading was the center of the cult of St. James in England, and pilgrims would have made their way here to venerate the hand before likely making their way to the closest seaport via the ancient capital city of Winchester, and catching a boat to the shores of Galicia following the modern day Camino and Glass to the tomb of the apostle. This route is now waymarked with the distinctive dark blue way markers with yellow arrows and a scallop shell and stamps are available from several churches along the route. The, uh, the tourism arm of the local Reading Council have put together a short promotional video uh, showcasing Reading as a place of historical interest uh, I don't know how this will go, but I'll, I'll press play and hopefully you'll be able to hear or see something. If not, then I can always put the URL of the video in the chat for you to watch.
hopefully that worked. Um, Again. Okay, so that is sort of a potted history of uh, the UK Caminos that we have recognised so far. As I said, we do have designs on getting a few more routes recognised and kind of building the UK Camino network uh, even further. Um, we've got routes lined up around Hereford and Worcester and Droitwich and Bristol, which are all kind of southwest England as well as uh, St David's in southwest Wales. It would be great to get a Welsh Camino in there as well. Um, of course, there have been challenges around establishing this network in the UK. Um, these have largely for us been to do with the setup of the Camino style infrastructure, um, like way marking and stamps, but in particular accommodation. Um, obviously a huge part of what makes the Caminos in Spain and Portugal in particular so accessible is the abundance of inexpensive accommodation. And this doesn't really exist in the UK at the moment. Um, so the main stumbling block with being able to walk these and other routes at the moment means you have to be a little bit creative in how you find places to stay each night. Often this involves finding transport, coming back on yourself, even coming home and going back again the next day. And if you're on a budget, then you are reliant on cheap camping facilities and youth hostels, um, the latter of which have been kind of hammered by the pandemic. So it's certainly on our agenda to raise the profile of pilgrimage in the UK and publicize the Camino model of just basic affordable accommodation for walkers, cyclists and riders on their way to a special place of meaning uh, that mean they don't have to shell out for hotels and B&Bs all the time. Um, but obviously at a time when the hospitality industry is on its knees and has been forced to increase their rates by a considerable margin, this is easier said than done. Uh, at the moment, the only cheap option for UK pilgrims is uh, something called champing, um, sleeping in churches. I don't know if you have that in, in the States. Um, and also youth hostel dormitories, um, a lot of which have not reopened since COVID. Um, nonetheless, <laughs> the enthusiasm for UK Caminos is very much there. Uh, there's a real appreciation for pilgrimage and the Camino in the UK right now, walking for health and a means of personal well-being, uh, provided a lifeline to so many over the last few years. And there is a collective desire to keep this going and make it easier for people. So we're optimistic that amongst our loyal membership is our regional groups and partners in the UK and in Galicia, uh, there is the people power to continue building the culture of Caminos in the UK and strengthen ties with the Camino Ingles in Spain. Uh, we want to walk toward, we want to work towards or walk towards an international Camino network, uh, which transcends not just borders, but also oceans, peoples, cultures, uh, and we'll get there one step at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening uh, and for having me. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen now. Um, looks like we've got a lot of a lot of comments and questions, but uh, do do far away. I'm just going to restart. There we go. Restart the video. Thank Hi. you so much for that, Freddie. We did have a couple questions while you were talking. Um, one of them was: Is there an English Camino that ends in Brighton? <laughs> uh, no, not really. No, I mean there is. Um, there's the South Downs Way, which is fairly well known in this country anyway um, and that starts in Winchester again actually and goes all the way to um, where does it go <laughs> Eastbourne it goes very near Brighton um, the history of that I don't know whether the authorities at Santiago would accept that as a as having kind of probable historical links to Jacobean pilgrimage or pilgrimage to Santiago, but it's definitely a very well-known long distance walking path um, in a, in a yeah, kind of populated part of the country. So um, uh, it's well worth exploring. There is also actually, there's a town called New Haven just down the coast from Brighton, which is a popular, people that want to walk from London. Sometimes it happens, we get people coming to us saying, I want to walk to Santiago from a house. Uh, and they start in London and there is a route that they can take goes down through South London and ends up at New Haven on the coast. It's called the Vanguard Way, I think, um, because at New Haven there is a ferry to France, it's a ferry to Dieppe um, for people wanting to sort of avoid flights and, and, and walk the whole way and sort of thing. So there's, there's, walking, there's walking paths around there, but none of them have communal status yet. 
Thank you. You talked a little bit about the lodging that's available and, and how some of it is not available also. Are there plans to increase lodging or, or do you know anything about, um, you know, kind of the next few years of what folks are thinking? Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of people want for there to be the equivalent of albergues or pilgrim hostels in the UK. Um, no kind of firm plans have been laid out as to how to achieve that. Um, at the moment, it's fairly ad hoc and sort of like, like volunteer based and, you know, churches offering for people to sleep in there or um, there was talk at one point of uh, people offering their own homes for, for people to stay in, but there was some kind of legal issues around that kind of safeguarding issues. So, yes, there's definitely the want, but um, yes, no kind of formal plans have been laid out yet. Okay, great. Um, I do want to say thank you for the questions in the chat. If y'all have questions, you are welcome to put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and I'll, I, you can turn your video on or however you want to do that. Um, so we have a couple more questions, Freddie. Uh, how receptive are churches to opening their doors to pilgrims? Is that in the UK? Yes. I'll assume, I'll assume yes. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I've heard anecdotally, uh, very interested. Um, obviously it's not as big a thing here as it is in Spain. So you, you will come across churches who will be wondering what on earth you're doing and why you're doing it. And I thought, I didn't think pilgrimage was a thing in this country anymore sort of thing. Um, but they're very, you know, obviously they're very interested and very inquisitive and they'll ask about it and start a conversation about it, which is important. Um, but, uh, generally, yeah, if, um, if the church is open, then, then yeah, we've even got some churches on those, um, ones with Camino status offering things like pilgrim blessings like if you do the St James's way for example from winning and um, we've got a really good relationship with the uh, church of St James there and they've said basically pilgrims wander in fairly com <clears throat> commonly now and uh, they offer like an ad hoc kind of pilgrim blessing um, if they want it which is lovely. Great we had another question about is a solo or a woman walker safe on these Caminos? In the UK, um, I mean, it's we get this question a lot in reference to the communities in Spain, as I'm sure you do. Um, I would say, as as safe as anywhere else, I think um, the the UK communities, um, yeah, most of them are signposted. Most of them are quite, um, yeah, well established and well documented, and uh, if and and also in quite sort of low crime rate areas because a lot of them are sort of in in the middle of the countryside and very kind of uh, you know peaceful parts of the country so uh, I would say yeah you're going to be as safe on these as, as you would be anywhere. Okay great we've got a couple questions in here about a map or a guidebook or even some URLs of resources that your organization could offer to. Yes so that's, I should have put that in the slides, didn't I? Um, we have some guidebooks to some of them at the moment. Um, each of the routes that normally have a volunteer organization looking after them, uh, and they usually have a website. Um, so I could try and put that in the chat now if I can remember. But basically, actually, if I show you the, um, the last slide again, um, I think it... Ooh. It shows the names of each of the um, kind of associations, if you like, of each route. And if you just type that into Google, um, you'll be able to find their website. So um, the British Pilgrimage Trust uh, actually is a really good overall one to look at. Um, the URL for that, where's my chat? Um, so. British Pilgrimage Trust, which is like the umbrella organization, if you like, for all pilgrim routes in this country, and that is BritishPilgrimage.org. Um, and other than that, you can see the list there. There's, um, if you just type in Pilgrim's Way, um, there's a website about it. If you type in the Friends of St. Michael's Way, um, and the same for the rest of them, um, then it will take you to, to those. But we are actually working towards, and it's just a uh, it's in planning stages at the moment, but we would uh, love to have a guidebook to all of these routes, to all of the UK communities, or at least a good handful of them, um, so that people can sort of pick and choose 
which one they want to do before heading to Acarunia. Um, yeah, still in planning stages at the moment, but until then we have a guidebook to the St. James's Way, we have um, a guidebook to the Pilgrim's Way, which has been produced by Cicerone, which is the um, um, kind of, yeah, publishing house, long distance walking routes. Um, so yeah, it's kind of bits and pieces at the moment, but as I say, we're working towards one complete publication that will hopefully have guides and routes and maps to, to all of them eventually. Great. Uh, there was also a request for the website for the video from Reading. Yeah. Um, so the organization is called Reading UK. They're the tourist kind of arm of the local council there. And um, the video is called. Uh, 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 Reading for modern pilgrims. So again, if you type that into YouTube, um, then it should pop up. Thank you. I think I've gotten all the current questions in the chat. I think I've done that. If I missed one, please uh, put it back in the chat or, or um, raise your hand, or you can just unmute yourself, whatever's easiest for you. And if you wanted to look at the guidebooks that we do have, um, do not just UK Caminos, but communities in general, that's the URL for our web, website shop, if you wanted to. We have other books that we've not published, but we stock other books uh, that people have written to um, various kind of pilgrimage routes in the UK. We actually, we have a monthly book club, um, and this month's book is a book called Pilgrim Pathways. Um, and that is a guide to 20 uh, weekend pilgrimages that you can do all around UK and um, so we'll be discussing that on on Tuesday again if you want the details of it it's all on our on our website um but uh yeah we have books like that in the shop as well is the I'm guessing the book club is on zoom it is that's right yeah oh, yeah sounds fantastic <laughs> um I I have a couple of questions if if you guys have questions please feel free to jump in but I had a couple from the talk too are the, the routes well marked? Are they easy to see the turns or do you need to take maps with you? Um, some better than others. There are some routes which are very well well marked um, throughout and it's it's very obvious where, where to go and you probably don't need a map, again, but like the Camino. Um, there will be others which for various reasons, the way marking is not quite, um, you can't rely on it without using something like a map or a guidebook. Um, it, yeah, we found that once you've got all of the right permissions in place to be able to put these things up and then you put them up and then mysteriously they disappear. So it does rely on kind of like volunteers stationed on all sections of all of these routes to kind of go and make sure that the way mark is still there. They've not been taken down or they've not been damaged or not fallen off or something. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's probably the case for, for a couple of the routes, but, but generally, um, yeah, you can rely on, on way markets pretty much. Um, you might want to take a guidebook with you just in case, or like consult the website on your phone or something as you go along, um, cause you might find out some interesting things. It will also tell you sort of what the local facilities are. Um, but, uh, way marking is by and large pretty good, I think. We had another question about do any of the routes have associated apps with them? Mm, good question. I'm rubbish with apps. Um, to my knowledge, no, but definitely worth a definitely worth a search because um, that might have changed recently. But um, I've I've not come across any. Okay, and I think in your talk you mentioned that your organization works with or you run two albergues in Spain. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about those and, and where they are and are they operational all year and kind of how y'all run those? Yeah, so um, we have two. One of them is on the Camino Front Desk in a village called Rabanal, which is, um, I think it's a day or two after Astorga. Um, so sort of three-fifths, I guess, into the Camino Front Desk um, near the Montes Leon. It's very near um, the Cruz de Ferro, actually. 
Um, and that, yeah, was set up in 1991 um, when the village, there wasn't much in the village at all. There was certainly nowhere to stay, barely anywhere to eat. And um, it was just identified by um, early members of the CSJ back then. And um, they converted an old diocesan barn into a pilgrim refuge. And uh, it's, it's done extremely well. It's, it's Donativo, both of our hostels are Donativo, which means that um, you just make a donation towards the, the cost of your stay. There's no fixed charge. Um, in, in Rabanel, they named it uh, Refugio Galfelmo after a local hermit apparently that used to live there. Um, and they, um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, fairly well known now a lot of people uh talk about their time to, to uh, the time staying there um they serve afternoon tea it's like a, just a little slice of england in the middle of the spanish countryside um and then yeah our second one is on the norte route uh, it's in galicia it's very it's again in a village and it's very remote um and again it's run by csj volunteers so there is a committee kind of running each and they um recruit for volunteer hospitaleros and hospitaleras um, to staff the refuge from March to November. So they do close over the winter. Um, and there's just a team of between two and four hospitaleros um, running the place at two, in kind of two week stints. Um, so they have their training at the beginning of the year and then they're rotated on for the whole season. And then they go out there and, um, and look after the pilgrims and clean the place and uh, exterminate the bed bugs as and when that happens. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, um, sadly they have been, um, sorry, it's my next waking up for some reason. Um, yes, they uh, have been closed for the last couple of years because of the pandemic and it was, it was just too complicated to try and coordinate, you know, dozens of volunteer hospitaleros getting out there and being safe out there and looking after pilgrims safely and um, it was just um, a bit too much but they did reopen on the 1st of April so earlier this month um, and are having a lovely time looking after pilgrims again. There's a couple of questions in here could an American pilgrim trained hospitalero could they volunteer once y'all have your systems up and running? I believe so, yes. So the, the requirement is either you need to be a member of the CSJ or you need to be a member of um, another uh, association. So the American Pilgrims and the Camino, the Canadian Company of Pilgrims send over a few hospitalers every year. We get a few from the Australian friends of the Camino. Um, and if they haven't had training already, then we can provide them with training. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, they do that every year, both hostels. Any other questions that I missed in the chat or that y'all have that you want to say? Yes, Steve. Oh, hi, Steve. I didn't see you there. Yes, um, been very kind and, and giving us a grant for, I think, a fence at Mirath. There's all sorts of little kind of maintenance things that I just never think of in relation to running a building. And uh, yeah, the one at Mirath recently has been a broken fence. and. Uh, American Pilgrims have very kindly um, offered a grant to fix this fence for them in, in Mirath, which is lovely of them. So many, many thanks. We want to make One. mending fences part of our mission. Yep. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> it's a, that was good, it's a Steve. I support towards. that. Um, for those of you who may not know, Steve Litch is on the call. There he is. Um, and he is the chair of American Pilgrims on the Camino. So um, he's on here. So thanks, Steve, for letting us know about that. And Holly, it looks like you have a question. Yes, I just wanted to know, when you're establishing these new routes, are you going over existing rights of way or are you approaching farmers and stuff and asking for new footpaths through their land and what's their response? Yeah, it's a mixture. So um, some of the routes uh, go over already existent routes, which is, um, yeah, easier. Um, Firstly, because it's signposted and you can put things in the guidebook, like just follow the signpost for the St. Swithin's Way, for example. Um, and other ones, I know the one from London to Walsingham, a lot of that has been uh, newly kind of charted and has involved getting in touch with the local councils um, and private landowners um, to, to allow people to walk, walk past. And normally the reception has been um, quite good. Um, once it's sort of explained that these will be 
people making a pilgrimage, um, that tends to uh, disarm people um, <laughs> uh, who might be otherwise suspicious. But um, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, the, the response has been has been really positive. Any other questions or comments? Oh, uh, we have a question over here. Are the pathways noted on the ordinance survey maps as Camino ways? Not yet, no, that's, um, that's on the list of, of things that we'd like to make happen, definitely, but, uh, but not at the moment, sadly. Have the CSJ members experimented with couch surfing for American compatriots coming over to the UK? Yeah, well, we'd, we'd love to. Again, I think these days there are um, uh, sort of safeguarding things that we have to do, like if, if someone's going to offer up their couch kind of habitually to, then you need licenses and you need all sorts of stuff. So it's not quite as easy as um, uh, as we would want it to be, sadly. But uh, yeah, that's that's sort of the conversation that that we were having a while ago, and um, and we have been put in our place by um, people who with a better knowledge of governance than us. <laughs> All right, well, first I wanna say thank you to all of you who joined us. Thank you to Freddie for the wonderful presentation. There's a lot of great thank yous in the chat and appreciation as well. So um, thank, thank you, you so much for joining us today. No I am, thank you very much for having me. Thank you everyone.